KOWS 107.3 FM, Occidental, California. On the telephone, we have Morris Berman. Good afternoon. Hi, Ken. How are you? I'm well, sir. How are you? All right. Uh, very. It's always a special occasion to have Morris uh, Berman with us, uh, not least of which because... Uh, there are many people who uh, read uh, Professor Berman with great attention and uh, sobriety. Uh, Morris Berman has been uh, showing us uh, a way of looking at reality and our uh, American uh, national uh, history and destiny uh, with a particularly uh, courageous and uh, unflinching eye. And it's uh, it ain't easy, but I think it's enormously uh, helpful, and uh, Professor Berman has been nourishing our understanding for many, many years. Thank you for coming back. No, it's glad. I think this is the third time around, Ken, it's good to be back. It is indeed, and for those who uh, follow along in their scorecards, uh, M- Morris Berman was with us uh, May 24th and December 27th of 2010, and those uh, visits can be uh accessed at pantedmonkey.org, May 24th and December 27th of last year. So it's been a good, uh, almost a full year since we heard from you, and uh, we have in our possession now uh, the third uh, volume of your uh, marvelous trilogy. Um, th- there isn't a title for the trilogy itself, is there? No, I just call it the uh, the American Empire trilogy or something like that. You know? Okay, yeah, we 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 get the we get it. Uh this this volume is titled Why America Failed: The Roots of Imperial Decline and one can't help but notice right away that this is uh past tense that this uh is presented as a fait accompli. Yeah, that I mean that's very important to me because um I think I may have mentioned this once before on uh, on the show I can't remember but that when I read um, analyses of America in trouble, that genre, uh, usually in the last 10 pages, after the author documents uh, the horror of whatever it is, the American educational system, or the prison system, or you name the institution, it's a horror. And then at the end, last 10 pages, they say, but you know what, this can be turned around. <laughs> say right and what's the formula and it's an act of will see if we have the right attitude and you know it's a, history has never worked that way and it never will but that's okay but what i wanted to do was put it in the past tense because my honest assessment is that uh it has failed and there's no last minute rabbit out of the hat recovery that i can present in any honest way and so why do it i'm just saying what i honestly see. You know. mm-hmm. uh, I noticed that you uh, you gave uh, uh, an interview about a week ago to KPFT in Houston, which is uh, on your uh, website. That's right, yeah. And uh, I thought that, you know, I think a lot of people uh, follow you and listen to you when, they, when you make yourself uh, available. And um, I just, it just occurred to me that rather than repeat you know, last week's interview again, or go through the same material that we would direct people, uh, interested parties to uh, listen to that interview, if if you found it uh, satisfactory. Uh, I should ask you that first, or off the air. No, that's that's absolutely fine. And uh, the the person at um, KPFT, uh, Mark Bavawi, was an excellent, you know, interviewer. I mean, I thought he really came up with a very good questions and thoughts and, and that sort of thing. And um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I hope that uh, people can find it on my blog, com, or I presume if you just put KPFT, KPFT T Berman interview it'll, on Google, it'll show up. Mm-hmm. So I think it makes sense that, uh, you know, if there were things that after the interview, if you felt, well, I should have uh, talked more about this or, or that, I thought maybe you would just uh, uh, pick up where you left off last week and, uh, and take it from there. So um, I invite you to kind of self-direct the interview uh, so that we can get uh, the most uh, uh, bang for the buck, so to speak. No, thanks. I think that would be a good approach. I um, yeah, I thought, you know, as I said, Mark was asking some good questions, and uh, it was kind of time-restricted. I mean, there was 
40 minutes, something like that, but they were having a fun drive. Mm. So it, it sort of like interrupted at a few points. But, um, I mean, one thing that occurred to me was that at the end, at the very end, and to me it was very instructive, it's following up on just what we were saying about the last 10 pages of sudden optimism. It's so typical. <laughs> uh, you know, the um, uh, mark at the very end, um, you know, we had been talking about... <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, the sort of dead-end quality that I saw uh, in the United States now in terms of social or political change. And uh, I said, you know, quite honestly, at this point, if you don't take it institution by institution, but if you integrate the whole thing and see what the, the, that it's all linked, uh, we have as, about as much chance of turning this country around now as we would uh, turning an aircraft carrier around in a bathtub. Mm -hmm. And at the very end, um, Mark suddenly came up with this stuff about, um, uh, well, you know, uh, there was the Arab Spring, and I, I'm Egyptian, and I look at uh, what happened in Tahrir Square, and so on and so forth. And so I feel that uh, we can enlarge the bathtub to an ocean, and we'll be able to turn the aircraft carrier around, and so on. And that was it. That was the end of the interview. And I sort of had to chuckle to myself because, number one, it was the classic thing. After I had, you know, made it clear why this was a no-exit situation, suddenly, oh, no, but there's a chance. Here's, here's an optimistic point of view. You know, rabbit out of a hat. And secondly, I didn't have the opportunity to respond. Now, that's not Mark's fault. They just ran out of time, basically. But it, to me, it sort of was, well, what have we been talking about then? You know, um, and so there was a there was a problem for me in that that fell into the classic category of let me tell you in the last ten pages how as an act of will this can be turned around because there is such an enormous resistance to hearing the message that if you really look at the institutions of the United States how they're linked and where where the corruption at the basis of all of them. You put all that together. By, by what act of will or consciousness could could this become different? You know, and we need to talk about the obviously the Occupy Wall Street protests for a moment in in the context of that. But how is this? How are we going to possibly turn this around? But there is this diehard kind of optimism in the context of there being no basis for it, um, that somehow we're going to pull it out. And to me, that stands in the way of really getting anywhere or understanding anything, because um, I think we would be much better off uh, throwing in the towel, so to speak, and say, well, you know, we struck out. We struck out. We, the American experiment ultimately failed, and now we need to do a post-mortem. And that's what this book, Why America Failed, is about. Mm -hmm. um, it is, in particular, an examination of the deep-rooted sources of what went wrong. And along with that, I wanted to mention another book. I, between Volume 2 and Volume 3 of this series, I did a collection of essays called A Question of Values that's available on Amazon. And I would encourage people to take a look at that because there's material in those essays on the United States that is not reproduced elsewhere in my work, mm -hmm. but that talks about deep unconscious programming that has guided the United States right onto the reef um, that has caused it to crash. And um, I, I think those essays are, are kind of important in this context because it really reveals the fact that um, it's it's not so much a matter of conscious control as a very deep belief systems that all Americans are caught up in, whether it's the man or woman in the street or the president. Uh, and, and one of those is that we can fix and solve any problem we want when the truth is that real life is simply not like that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, I'm... I'm not 
I'm not past all that myself. I still uh, cherish uh, deep uh, ideas about transformation and about uh, even granted that the American experiment uh, uh, came a cropper and uh, it was flawed at its root and uh, it's crashed and burned and it's not coming back and uh, and goodbye and so long. Uh, I still uh, dream of uh, of the human species of our human family uh, uh, evolving or reconfiguring in 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 ways where we can have uh, not only a viable future but a good future but that's a that's a realistic optimism in other words I don't disagree with that in fact I say it at the end of Dark Ages America the second book volume in the trilogy I say I don't have any hope for America but I do have hope mm-hmm. for the human spirit and the human race mm-hmm. and I do it's just that the United States is not going to be the place of this revival right, and renaissance. Right, right, it can't be. Right, right. Um, but that it will happen somewhere else, of that I have no doubt, because that's, that's part of the human character. Mm-hmm. And, and we will, you know, regenerate again. After entropy, there's the attempt, yeah. a, again, at organization. So I have that faith, and I frankly have no doubt. And it'll be interesting. You know, I won't be around 100 years from now, but... But it would be interesting to be a fly on the wall in heaven Mm -hmm. looking down. Well, for me, I'll be in hell looking up. But it would be interesting to see all that and see what what form it takes. But um, as in the case of the Roman Empire, the resurrection was not uh, on Roman soil. You know, it was in northern Europe. It happened in a completely different area. So. So we don't have to go down with the ship. That we can, we can, we can tease out our human values, our better, our best human values, and our our best human identity. We can tease it out from what's actually, when all is said and done, a secondary uh, uh, modifying identity. Uh, you know, temporarily identified with a certain uh, institution that we can call America. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, in the first volume of the series, the the Twilight of American Culture. You know, I came up with the notion of the new monastic option, or the new monastic individual, who the the analogy was with Rome. As Rome collapsed, you had the emergence of monastic societies uh, that uh, were intent on preserving Greco-Roman culture, and did, and did. And that was the the Renaissance that occurred in Northern Europe in the 12th century. Um, But um, the, the analogy... Uh, today would be that there are individuals within the United States, uh, and certainly many, many in Europe, that uh, can do that work of uh, preservation and eventual mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. renaissance. Um, there's, th- I mean, that's a that's a valid path to follow. I would still defend that. It's just that, as a whole, the United States doesn't. Re- as, there's a difference between what individuals do and what the the nation does it as a whole, and as a whole, the right. ship is going down. Right. Right. But what what individuals can do in terms of local work, cultural preservation, and so on, uh, um, I mean, I see myself in that category. That's what these books are about, you know. And, and uh, I find it extremely satisfying, even if it's depressing, because... To me, it's not depressing. I feel, hey, you know, honestly, this is the best I can do. And other people can do in their areas of interest or expertise the things that they feel valuable uh, in terms of preservation or uh, pointing to new directions and so on. All that's worth doing, even if you don't ultimately know the outcome. You know, I, I doubt I'll even be a footnote in any any books 50 years from now. I can't imagine it. But um, in the meantime, uh, and it's also the case that, you know, we're not talking about thousands of people paying attention to me, but there may be hundreds. And so what? You know, I mean, life isn't a popularity contest, and I'm just trying to do the bit I can. Well, I suspect there are thousands. Uh, I I want to inform uh, those unfamiliar with Professor Berman that uh, his background includes uh, studies of mathematics and a Ph.D. in history of science from Johns Hopkins. And uh, one of the things that I particularly like about your books is uh, that you share with us uh, your keen uh, study of uh, history and literature and philosophy, and you, um, you refer to uh, 
uh, you know, to uh, other uh, thinkers and writers who have uh, important things to say or intriguing things to say. So it, it's really kind of a, a, a classroom feeling uh, with, uh, you know, with you uh, at the front, you know, uh, uh, talking to us and, and showing us things. I also want to say that uh, I, I've always, I find reading Morris Berman uh, almost brutal and difficult. And I'm very grateful for it because uh, after initially uh, wondering, gee, how bitter can one man be, uh, I begin to see that I don't think it's so much bitterness as uh, holding up a very honest and difficult mirror to ourselves and our culture and our country. And I think this is a service uh, that you that you do for us um, uh, in in a, in a, in, a, in a in an ex, in a fashion that's uh, that in a rare and excellent way. So there you go. Well, thank you, Ken. It's very nice of you to say. I'm not bitter at all. I mean, that that really is the truth. I'm occasionally angry. I'm sad a lot, but I can't say that I'm bitter or depressed. I mean, the test of that would be when you wake up in the morning. Do you want to go through the day? <laughs> and and uh, you know, I mean. Uh, Almost every day of the month that I wake up, I say, wow, another day. And uh, I go to it, and I enjoy it. And, uh, I mean, I was once, I did a a lecture tour for, um, you know, sponsored by Norton uh, for Dark Ages America. And I remember the very first uh, bookstore I did was uh, the community bookstore on 7th Avenue in Brooklyn. And uh, about 40 people showed up, you know, and uh, somebody said to me, you know, how do you manage to get up in the morning, <laughs> you know, without shooting yourself and so on? I said, that, you know, the honest answer to that is that the truth makes me high. Yeah. I'm doing my best to actually describe what's going on as opposed to the total obfuscation that you get from the New York Times or whatever it is you're going to read in the United States. Most of it is just comic books, really. Yeah. Um, and uh, to me, uh, it's an exciting adventure, even if the ship is going down, to say, hey, here's why it's going down, here's how it's going down, here's what you can do about it if you're interested. Uh, you can't stop it from going down, but there are things you can do for yourself, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, I don't, I mean, that's not the attitude of a bitter or depressed person, and those aren't my emotions. Yeah. No, there's a spring in your step. Uh, I, we we can hear it. <laughs> you know, I, I read the New York Times every morning of my life. I, it's just uh, monitoring uh, the, uh, the 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 meta consciousness of uh, of uh, American culture. I guess I don't know. The, the, these aren't the, the the best words to use. I'm. Uh, I have nothing precise to say about it. I just thought I'd, I'd tell you. Yeah, that no, I'm, I'm, I understand what you're saying. I mean, my own, my own take on it is that it's the mouthpiece of the professional classes. Mm. The New York Times yeah. provides what the, the mm-hmm. professional classes in the United States wish to hear. Yeah. So I've yeah. often said that they, you know, the, the, the motto on the on the top of the mass, the, on the top of the newspaper page, when all the all the news that's fit to print. I, mm-hmm. I've often said they should change it to all the news that fits our views, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, they, I mean, that's what they're doing. They're just acting as a mirror. And so you get people mm-hmm. who are among the worst analysts and the worst writers that uh, the English language has ever produced. People <laughs> like David Brooks or Thomas Friedman. Mm-hmm. Nothing more than corporate shills. I mean, that's all these guys are, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and their analysis is ludicrous. I mean, the books that they write are ludicrous. Uh, I remember Matt Tybee of Rolling Stone, who's a real journalist, you know, uh, once doing an article a, a couple of years ago that had the, actually had the title, Somebody Take Away Thomas Friedman's Computer Before He Types Another Sentence. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and, I mean, all that's true. I mean, you, you know, this is largely a reflection of the middle class of itself. You have David Brooks telling them how wonderful they are. Gee, how what an accident he is it is that he becomes a columnist, you know. And that's that's the, the function it serves. Meanwhile, if you don't want the comic book version of what's going on in the United States, you have to go to online sources. Mm-hmm. Truthnet, Truth Out, Alternet, uh, Rolling Stone, uh, Truth Dig, um, uh, Huffington Post, Common Dreams, all those websites, that's the real journalism. 
Mm-hmm. It's people like Matt Tybee or Robert Shear, or Chris Hedges, and so on. Those are the people who are digging up the real stories, mm-hmm. uh, rather than making the, the middle class feel good about itself while the ship is going down and they with it. You know, New York Times doesn't care about that. It just wants to feel good. Well, um, I find that by reading the New York Times, I don't have to watch one minute of television ever. <laughs> and that's well, sufficient for me. Yeah, that would be a step down from the New York Times. <laughs> yeah. um, you quote uh, Thomas Lewis et al. in a book, uh, evidently, called uh, A General Theory of Love, evidently a compilation of some sort. And uh, the quote is, A good deal of modern American culture is an extended experiment in the effects of depriving people of what they crave most. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Let's... I love that quote. It's a uh, this is a good book. It's just a it's it's not a compilation. It's just that he and two other neuroscientists, mm-hmm. I guess it was, um, did a book talking about uh, what human satisfaction really is, as opposed to uh, the value system in the United States that provides a large network of pseudo satisfactions. And frankly, as the cliche goes, uh, if you're eating stuff that you don't want, then you can never get enough of it to fill yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who was Philo Farnsworth? Guy who invented the television, 1927. (laughs) And I mention that in the book because, I mean, I I think if I understand correctly the story, I mean, I, I wrote the book a year ago, so it's vague in my mind, but I think it was that Robert Steinhoff or somebody at, at, in the television studios at NBC stole it from him, and so he never really got the credit. But I mentioned him because uh, the very first image he chose to project uh, with this device, this screen that became television, the very, very first image he chose was the dollar sign. It wasn't a heart, wasn't a map of the United States, wasn't a banana. It was the dollar sign. And there we have it, you know, the union of technology and economic expansion as being the defining culture of the United States. And as I say in the book, America failed because it only allowed one type of culture. And it wiped out all the other alternatives and so became so lopsided that it finally tipped over. And we're seeing that in our time. Mm -hmm. And this is the culture of hustling. Yeah, right. It's that there's always an angle and you're always looking to get ahead and how can I profit from the situation? And that is really the American dream. And it's not that hustling is uniformly wrong, but the question is, where does it fit into the ecology of the total life? I mean, if as long as there's commerce, there's hustling. So there's hustling in ancient Sumer and, you know, Egypt and so on and so forth. Hustling is not the same as capitalism. But the, the, the question becomes, in the total ecology of any nation or civilization, uh, what's the role of that? And in the United States, it became everything. Uh, Lewis Hartz, great great American historian who wrote a classic work called The Liberal Tradition in America, this 1955, he had the idea of what he called fragment societies. And he said certain societies are actually the development of fragments of the European experience. And in the United States, one particular fragment was taken, and that was of the English middle class in the 17th century that was very entrepreneurial, aggressive, uh, competitive, and economic expansionist. And uh, that was just a fragment of all of England, but that fragment got blown up into the whole for the United States. Mm -hmm. It's what defined it entirely. Mm -hmm. And so then all alternatives get shut down, and the the story of, of the book, that, uh, Why America Failed, is the story of those alternatives, Emerson, Thoreau, Lewis Mumford, John Kenneth Galbraith, Jimmy Carter, whatever. I mean, there are quite a few. Um, all of those getting shut down, regarded as kind of quaint or idealistic, you know, whereas the real, real life, see, real life is about hustling and accumulation. And finally, if you do that, Even if you're a success, you're a failure because this is no way to live. 
it's a sick way to live, and it deprives you of meaning and value yeah. and beauty. And so what the non-hustlers were trying to do was to point to that, but they always got laughed at or dismissed. And um, finally, we've come to the point that um, it's that that way of life, what, you know, what Thoreau or Emerson were saying, is totally unrecognizable now. And we're left with the fact that our success is our failure. And what a tragedy that is, really. Uh, Professor Berman, I need to back up uh, a minute uh, because in my own feeble way, I try to hold on to whatever little integrity I have left. Oh, come and, on, don't give me that. <laughs> okay, I won't. Um, I, I like Thomas Friedman. I, I, I have respect for him. I read him carefully, and I don't know why he's ragged on so mercilessly. Well, so what does that say? What is what? Where? What am I blind to, or what? What's all the uh, the antagonism about? Well, the the thing is that this is a guy who has come out in a very big way for globalization, and if you read those works, what he does is flip from corporate boardroom to corporate boardroom, and he creates all these buzzwords, uh, you know, these business corporate. Uh, commercial buzzwords that are really hip, and this is then becomes his analysis of what's happening, for example, in India or China. All the studies of globalization, oh, I can't say all, many studies of globalization basically indicate that what it does is it creates a larger gap between rich and poor. So what Friedman does is focus on, you know, a certain certain segment of the middle class, let's say, in India, that's making it as a result of its own Americanization. Yeah. But he doesn't talk about the millions that are sinking into poverty because of that, mm -hmm. because that's what capitalism does. It separates winners from losers, mm -hmm. and it creates a larger and larger gap between them. When you are flitting between corporate boardrooms and interviewing the CEOs of these successful companies, I mean, why not get into the streets of Calcutta and talk to the people that are suffering because of those CEOs? That would be a different story to tell. You know, and then, as Tybee says, this is a guy who, you know, talks about the importance of the Green Revolution and ecology and so on. Meanwhile, he's got this huge mansion in suburban Maryland. Uh, the energy suck must be quite enormous from that. Um, the idea always, even whether it's a green option or whatever the option is, is that it fil get filtered through corporations. Mm -hmm. So, of course, people like Friedman and Al Gore are going to make millions upon millions of dollars from this um, when there are alternatives that are grassroots alternatives that are non-corporate alternatives, NGO alternatives, and so on, that would be a, a whole lot better uh, for the nation in terms of distribution of wealth and so on. I mean, there's a great list that we could take. And, you know, I don't particularly feel like making a big deal about one particular individual, but what's symptomatic is that he would have this huge mouthpiece, this uh, platform, uh, because if you can get that platform in the United States, it's obtainable. Mm -hmm. But you have to say basically what the corporations in the Pentagon want. Mm -hmm. If you say that, then you're a person of great insight, and you get a column in the New York Times, and mm -hmm. you know people will listen to you. And if you say something different, as I discuss in Why America Failed, you get shut out and marginalized as an alternative voice. Yeah. You know, it's not an accident that for 30 years of his life, Noam Chomsky had to publish uh, his non-linguistic work, his work on foreign U.S. foreign policy, with South End Press in Boston. South End Press consisted of two rooms and a couple of guys with a typewriter. Mm -hmm. This, uh, You know, I mean, his books were never reviewed. You never heard from him. Uh, when he was on Charlie Rose a few years ago, Charlie never even let him speak because Charlie was so frightened by what he was saying, he shouted him down. Um, this is the marginalization of alternative voices. But if you're a voice like David Brooks or Thomas Friedman or any of these characters, oh, well then, you know, you get to dominate the airwaves because this is what the corporations want to hear. After all, who owns the New York Times? Who owns NBC? You know, these are not grassroots organizations. These are organizations with billions of dollars behind them. And uh, 
they expect you to, to dance to their tune, and they have no dearth of people lining up to do just mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Okie doke. Uh, well, you would know about marginalization. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you have suffered uh, uh, Due to this dynamic and, uh, you know, my hat's off to you because you uh, you persist and you you talk about integrity. Uh, It's clear that you uh, hold on to your own and just, uh, you know, live the life that is uh, available to you to the best of your ability. Uh, What am I talking about? Let's move to Occupy. I want we'd love to hear uh, Morris Berman's uh, view of Occupy. And I just want to throw in quickly that last week I heard. Uh, I heard it described as the first native movement of the digital generation. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a pretty interesting uh, take on it. But uh, take it, Professor Berman. Well, you know, I mean, the first thing that's obvious to say is that I'm not, I'm an historian and not a prophet. Um, it would be hard at this point to guess where this thing is going. Um, it's large, amorphous decentralized and it's um, not clear uh, what's on the horizon uh, because uh, it's unpredictable right now and could go in any direction really Um, so you know like a lot of people um, you know like Chris Hedges or Nomi Klein or Ralph Nader and so on. I mean, I'm in the category of saying, gee, I don't know what success would look like exactly, but I hope they have it. Um, you know, I hope it really takes off. I hope it changes things in the United States, all that sort of thing. Um, so, I mean, that's the, the first thing that, that I would uh, have to say about it. Um, the, uh, I guess the concern I have, well, before I say that, um, it's also the case that it's interesting for me to observe uh, in the wake of uh, repeated demonstrations from the 60s and later on how little uh, the mayors of American cities have learned mm. or how little the police have learned. Mm. Uh, how stupid they are, really, I mean, in the psychological sense, that uh, if you want to fan the flames and increase the protest, the thing to do is be repressive. Um, tear gas the people, beat them, pepper spray them, and so on, because then that creates an outpouring of support and sympathy. Uh, this is precisely, I mean, frankly, if I were the mayor of a city and didn't want OWS around, uh, I would serve them hot meals, I would provide heaters and porta potties, um, books, you know, bookshelves for their libraries. Uh, I would. Uh, I would even roll a red carpet right through uh, their headquarters. Um, They would be gone in two weeks. Uh, If I wanted to increase the protest and make it more vigorous and antagonistic and powerful, I would pepper spray them and club them and so on and so forth. And mayors of American cities and the police are generally so stupid, whether in Oakland or New York, as to do precisely that. Um, So it's kind of interesting to see that um, lack of intelligence being repeated. Um, but, you know, in terms of where it might be going, um, this is the problem that I have with it is that I, and again, I haven't been down to Wall Street. I you know, walked around Zuccotti Park. I'm nowhere near there. So I can't be sure of this. I'm just judging from news reports and what I read online. But the thing that, uh, the impression I get is that the demand is for the American dream to be available to everybody. So the signs read, we are the 99%. The argument being that 1% has the American dream. Um, And, uh, I mean, the actual figures are that the collective wealth of the top 1% is now more than the bottom 90%, the collective wealth of the bottom 90% of the population, which indicates that we have slipped into banana republic status. I mean, we are now a plutocracy. The social inequality in the United States is actually worse than it is in Tunisia or Egypt. Um, says a lot. But I mean, we're, we basically moved on to banana republic status. So the, the, um, this is the, uh, the claim or the desire is to spread the American dream around, uh, that it's been unfair, that it's, it's, 
created an underclass and they don't have access to it and so on. Um, and as I, you know, said in my interview with um, KPF, KPFT the other day, um, if that's the level of the demand, that's easily bought off. Whether, whether the powers that be have the intelligence to buy it off, um, as in, you know, pr- providing porta potties and heaters to the protesters. But in this case, it would be much larger. It would be sort of like the crumbs that were provided by the New Deal. If they were smart enough to do it, uh, they would just share a tiny, tiny bit of that wealth, and probably, mm-hmm. probably, uh, the demonstrations would go away. Mm-hmm. Just provide a little health care, you know, a little social security, <laughs> just a little of these things. Um, they may not be smart enough to do it. Uh-huh. Uh, but the the thing that I'm looking for when I see their signs and, and read interviews or articles about it, I'm looking for somebody to say, you know, the American dream itself is wrong. Mm-hmm. It was always wrong. Yeah. Um, it was always about uh, an expanding, infinitely expanding economy and technology. And um, that this is basically... Uh, a problem of basing what you're doing on infinity because they, we don't have these unlimited resources and not every country in the world can live like us and shouldn't. And finally, the problem is not that the American dream is not more equitably distributed. The problem lies with the American dream itself. It's wrong. It's simply misguided. It's a, it's a moral and philosophical error. I, I haven't seen that. And again, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it exists, but um, that 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 would be attacked uh, as something that has to be dealt with. Um, that would be taking this thing in a whole new direction because it would be questioning the whole basis of American civilization, which I argue and why America failed is why it failed, and that it's a colossal error. Um, so I mean, we'll have to see. I, I'm I'm I still have hopes for the um, uh, the protests. I did a article on my blog um, that was called uh, something like Energy Versus Analysis, that we have tremendous energy, uh, partly because of this digital thing you, you mentioned, uh, um, and, and this youthful energy that uh, creates the demonstrations. But uh, then there has to be the phase of the analysis of what we're doing. Excuse me, and frankly, Cell phones aren't going to help you with that. Facebook isn't going to help you with that. Um, that's a whole different category. And in fact, uh, the damage done to the human mind by the digital revolution, by Facebook and uh, uh, cell phones and so on, is to uh, actually hurt synaptic connections. There's a lot of literature on this. So that Americans really aren't able to think, and they don't have very long attention spans which is what you need in order to develop a powerful argument. Mm-hmm. Um, so the mobilization of energy, and frankly, you don't need all this electronic stuff for it uh, anyway. I mean, the French Revolution didn't depend on it, neither did the Russian Revolution. Um, but given the fact that it's contributing, okay, that's fine. Uh, but after that, it actually robs young people of the ability to do the kind of deep and thoughtful analysis uh, that can never come out of a web page and uh, or a cell phone, and so that's my concern that we're never going to get to that stage, and that is going to be the deciding uh, factor. You know, in the um, May June uprising in Paris, at the Sorbonne, 1968, there were no cell phones around that I know of, or all this digital apparatus, but. It lasted two months, and it was like a constant teach-in. Not just uh, how can we make everybody in France, um, you know, have a greater share of the the French pie, as it were, but uh, what is life really supposed to be about, and what are we here for? Those were the kinds of debates, and uh, not a typical type of subject matter uh, in the United States, but that's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for uh, the protesters to move to a level of mm-hmm. saying, mm-hmm. and there was, a, there was a little bit of this. I mean, there were some mm-hmm. demonstrations in which uh, the, the, the people walked around uh, dressed as zombies, 
um, you know, imitating the, the people on Wall Street who are zombies and saying, who would want to live like that? I mean, life is, it, has got to have more than being a Dilbert in a cubicle. Now, that's, I think, what we need to get down to uh, finally. And uh, I, I don't know if we will, but, um, you know, like, like my colleagues uh, that I mentioned, um, I'm, I'm ho- this is better than nothing, for God's sakes, you know? <laughs> In a chapter uh, called The Illusion of Progress, you wrote, you write, the fog of techno-civilization is so dense in this country that any suggestion that a technological culture might be something of a mistake will only be met with blank incomprehension. Mm-hmm. So uh, you just said that. Um, well, uh, what's the best case scenario? For um, OWS? Well, uh, uh, by the way, uh, we're, we're broadcasting over KOWS. It's just a coincidence. Oh, nice. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, th- no, the, the best case scenario for the, for the human prospect, uh, uh, can we go through this um, disheartening cruel, stupid uh, part of our development, can we come out smelling sweet? Can we, can we fashion, you know, given, given the ubiquitousness of the technology that keeps us from being able to think or analyze or uh, present a decent argument in favor of anything, um, I mean, on the one hand, there's, there's something very uh, uh, fatalistic uh, about your argument. And then at the, on the other hand, uh, you, you, uh, you know, you're, you're not depressed and life is good and, 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 and our humanity is, is good. That, that we're not, uh, you know, that the country might be ruined or the, the 20th century might be ruined there's there's something there's some kind of implication there's a suggestion here that um that all is not lost yeah i think that's true and that goes back to what we were saying earlier that both you and i uh i think in a in a in a serious way uh contain or you know possess an optimistic streak uh in the overall picture i don't possess it for the united states but i do possess it for the human race because um, I think that, that finally there's a way out of entropy. But th- the argument I would make is that the way out is through. You can't sidestep it. The United States does have to fall apart now. The idea of it was wrong, but it did last 400 years. And if you start with, you know, settlement of the continent in the late 16th century, it lasted more than 400 years. And so um, the, the the real... What's on the other side, can't, you can't jump over the abyss. You have to actually push your way through the collapse. And uh, that's not a, a pretty thing. Uh, the waning of the Middle Ages, to quote the title of a famous book, was a very depressed period. And um, to get to the Renaissance took a long time. And it was the giving up of whole ways of life. What are the, these ways of life that we have to give up? Uh, one would be the very foolish notion, I think, that says that uh, poverty can be dealt with by economic growth and that um, the limitless economic growth is what life should be about or even what an economy should be about. And um, that is going to have to crash on the rocks. Um, Paul Krugman, of course, has called it a zombie doctrine because it has definitely, with the crash of 2008, established itself as non-workable, this laissez-faire casino cowboy capitalism. And yet you have, you know, most of Congress pushing for it and, and still believing in it. So finally, it's go- since, since they don't take their clues from reality, um, it's gonna, reality is going to have to get deeper and worse. And it will. It will. Uh, I think that the crash of 2008 is a prelude to much, much worse economic conditions. So I think there's going to be perhaps decades of real grimness. Um, the 
Finally, the, the idea that life is about accumulating wealth and the American dream and infinite growth and technological expansion and so on, the only way we're going to give that up is by its failure, and it will fail. And I see possibilities on the other side of that. But as I said, the way out is through. There's no, there are no shortcuts here. Um, the other thing is that there's going to have to be a working through of this whole romance of technology. And that, that chapter, The Illusion of Progress, that you cited, um, is about how deep that is within the American psyche, that it has a kind of fundamental religious hold on Americans, going back a long ways. And we saw, uh, you know, the, a typical resurgence of that with the death of Steve Jobs, where people showed up in front of his house with candles, you know, and uh, he becomes a, a saint in his death, and the New Yorker runs a cartoon, uh, you know, front cover of him going up to heaven, and the angel Gabriel has an iPad and all this kind of stuff. Um, there. We're going to have to get through that because technology is not, it's, it's, it's only a tool, it's not a solution. And we believe it's a solution. And finally, that has, that has to collapse as well. Um, this is going to take a long while because these are very deep roots in the American psyche and American history. But on the other side of that, um, you know, I, I actually believe that there is the possibility of a coming back um, to what is truly fundamental. Um, for human beings. And that quote you said about, from Thomas Lewis about... Um, Come in. Hello? Yeah, sorry. Uh, that, that, that quote that you uh, said about, uh, we it, it's a society that uh, is good at getting us to crave what we don't really want and, and substitute satisfaction. Uh, finally, when the dust settles, these things are not very complicated um, because what's really basic is not mysterious. Uh, we wish, uh, you know, to have food and shelter, to be comfortably clothed. We wish education. We wish to be healthy. We wish to enjoy nature. We wish to have some control over our lives. These are very basic things, and they don't have much to do with iPods or iPads or um, large mansions or uh, Hummers and all this crap, basically. And we're somehow, I mean, there, there's this very, very tiny percentage. Again, it's the alternative tradition. Um, Wordsworth called it plain living and high thinking. But there's a tiny fraction of the United States that does understand this. And the only way the rest of the United States, the 99.99% .99 that doesn't understand it, is going to get it is if this life of endless striving for profit and power collapses. And then on the other side of that, there may be a waking up to, you know, I really didn't want all that stuff anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't serving my purposes uh, at all, you know. And so I think it's going to take time. Um, but I have, again, I, I, I don't think in particular it's going to happen in the United States, but I think in other parts of the world there's going to be a recognition that um, the scientific technological capitalist culture uh, was finally a shuck, uh, and the traditional cultures had a much better handle on what it is that human beings really need and want and that there, there actually are political configurations, uh, social and political configurations, that can um, satisfy that, uh, so that you, you can get those things, which is love, friendship, community, things that are very cliched and ordinary, um, and, and have just gotten uh, sadly lost in this, uh, you know, techno-capitalist frenzy. Um, there was a cartoon in New Yorker, I, October was the 24th. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. I cut it out. Um, one of the most, the, the best cartoons the New Yorker has ever done in its history, in my opinion. But it basically shows a scene in hell. 
and everybody looks like they're dancing or exercising. And on top of the mountain, the devil is wielding a whip, and he's whipping them all. And one guy who's in this exercise position says to the guy next to him, I expected it to be awful, but not eternal Zumba. You know, these Zumba classes. And that's what I think of the United States. It's going through this huge Zumba class for 400 years, <laughs> thinking it was wonderful, and it was really hell. And maybe, you know, uh, one one person will turn to another and say, you know, Jesus, I'm not interested in eternal Zumba. <laughs> well, maybe that day will come. Well, you refer to the uh, to awakening, uh, to the understanding that you know we didn't really want this in the first place, or this never really made us really happy uh, uh, anyway. And that's a pretty uh, wonderful and special awakening. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, you know it's it's quite. You have to understand, when I started writing these books, I didn't know any of this stuff. It's not like I came in with a preformed opinion. In, fa- in fact, if anything, I had a preformed opinion that was positive. And there was a, as I did the research, there was a slow giving up of that and a slow unraveling of that. And then in this book, the last book, Why America Failed, I really, you know, took a look at the entire span of uh, American history, the, the history on the continent. And I saw that Hartz was right, you know, about these, um, the, the issue of the fragment society, that we picked a particular fragment. It's like saying that all of the mind is the ego, and it doesn't have any other parts to it, you know, like we don't have a dream life or something like that. All that exists is the ego, and that's the the fragmented mind and the fragmented society that just does one thing and then finally crashes on the rocks because there's no balance in the system if you're just doing one thing. And so I think that... um, You know, I mean, one of the things that I say on my blog is, look, we're in a position now that bad is good, because if something is pushing us toward this collapse and the possible realization um, of uh, a better world or a different world, then maybe we should get on with it. There was a different uh, New Yorker cover. um, Well, it wasn't a cartoon. It was was actually a cover a couple of years ago by Dan Klaus and... um, it was a post-apocalyptic scenario. You saw the ruins of New York City in the background, and an alien landed, so he's wearing a kind of space outfit. And um, he's sitting on a pile of iPads and iPods and cell phones and screens, basically. And he's just sitting on a pile of these wrecked things, just, you know, like a garbage dump of these things. And he holds in his hand a book, a real book. And the caption of the of the cartoon of the cover was future generations and that really is my hope um when i saw that i mean i had to laugh out loud because i thought well how's this going to take place but in fact bad is good i mean the worse things get ultimately the better they may get and we just have to go through it because it's not like all these optimistic books say in the last 10 pages, there's going to be this act of will or consciousness that's going to turn things around. History doesn't work that way. Things have to fall apart and decay. And then those options, those options that uh, were quaint and silly and we laughed at, you know, Thorsten Veblen and Lewis Mumford and uh, Henry David Thoreau and so on, all those, all of a sudden, they're going to seem a lot more intelligent and a lot more attractive. I remember years ago, you know, um, about three months ago, old friend of mine, Peter Berg, who was very big in the environmental movement in the Bay Area, died. And um, I remember in the late 70s, I was living in San Francisco. Peter and I mounted a conference uh, called Listening to the Earth. It was a four-day symposium. And we had Murray Bookchin there and Gary Snyder and... Uh, folks like this. And I remember having a discussion. I was on a panel with Gary Snyder and having a discussion with him, and I I baited him a bit about um, that what he was doing was a kind of romantic nostalgia for the past and so on. I mean, I didn't quite believe what I was saying, but I thought I'd put it out there and see how he responded. And he said to me, uh, you know, Maury, it's like the used parts bin. We have this feeling that only what's new is valuable. But finally, when that doesn't work out, you go back to the used parts bin, and you look at all these parts you threw out and neglected, and you say, hey, you know, 
that part's not so bad. Maybe we ought to resurrect that. He was absolutely right. Gary was absolutely right, because that's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to dig up those elements of traditional society and bring them back to our consciousness, because they did respond to our deepest needs. You know, I mean, the latest Steve Jobs toy or iPod or something, that doesn't respond to our deepest needs. That's a toy. That's all it is, you know. Professor Berman, I wish we had another 15, 20 minutes. Um, you know, I'm intrigued that one of, the, one of your chapters is entitled The Rebuke of History. Can, we have like a minute left. Can you just uh, tell us what you meant by that phrase, The Rebuke of History? Yeah, it's, it's the title of a book, I think, by Paul Murphy about um, the Southern Agrarians, which is a group um, of... Um, They've included Robert Penn Warren and Alan Tay and a group of intellectuals around Vanderbilt University in the 1920s. And in uh, 1930, they wrote a book with a very provocative title of I'll Take My Stand. And the the point of the Southern Agrarians, which I elaborate on in that particular uh, chapter, was that the South, uh, for all its faults, and slavery being the huge, dark, major fault or flaw um, represented the non-hustling way of life and that even though slavery had to go fair enough um, the problem with that whole thing was that the crushing of the south by the north and it was pretty brutal Sherman's march to the sea the murder of 50,000 civilians I mean, the whole the whole destruction of the south uh, the problem with that was that it never understood that there were elements to that culture that were quite valuable, and the elements were the non-hustling life. In fact, in 1860, most of the societies in the world, whether they had slavery or not, were non-hustling societies. Not England and not Northern Europe, surely, but most of the rest of the world was like the American South in the term of, terms of a, a kind of leisured, non-hustling uh, kind of society. And so uh, the rebuke of history is to say, uh, as the great Southern historian, for example, C. Van Woodward did, um, if you can't, if, if all you can see is the evil of the South, or in general, the evil of your enemy, which is the American tendency, if that's all you can do, then you can't recapture what was valuable about that, and then you remain crippled yourself, and that's the rebuke of history. Mm-hmm. So, I'm sure that this chapter will get misinterpreted and that, um, you know, in typical New York Post style, you know, I mean, they're not going to pay any attention to me anyway, but if they did, it would be Berman endorses slavery or some stupidity like this. <laughs> and I can just see it now, you know, uh-huh. pro-slave historian, uh-huh. you know. Um, but uh, in fact, what I'm talking about is that it's a delicate balancing act. Um, uh-huh. Slavery had to go, no question about it, but we neglected to look at the beauty of that society as well, uh, and uh, of traditional cultures as well. It's not that there aren't, isn't a downside to those cultures, but finally you have to choose your downside. And what I say is, you know, I, I would not be interested in living in a slave society, but I'm not interested in living in this one either. So what does a, a quote, mental Southerner do who's not interested in slavery, but wants to find that type of mm-hmm. culture? You know, I mean, that finally is the question of what lies beyond the hustling culture when it finally really collapses and it can't do, it, it has no place to go anyway it can't expand infinitely and so collapse is definitely on the horizon mm. but what would it mean to have a non uh, hustling culture that pays attention uh, to the things that are really significant and most meaningful uh, for human life I mean these are things like creativity and the enjoyment of life not you know, accumulating yet a fourth car and a fifth washing machine. The emptiness of that is just breathtaking. Mm-hmm. Hey, thanks for coming to talk to us. Thank you, Ken. I really enjoyed it. And uh, sooner or later, we'll have to do this again. I look forward to it. It's always a pleasure. Thanks okay. for all your work. Okay. Bye now. Bye-bye. Uh, Morris Berman. He lives in Mexico now. Uh, the book, uh, the, the last of a trilogy that began with the talk. 